anoint her heart to understand. Anoint her personal care will receive everything you are giving to us in Jesus' name. Teach us your word, lead us in the way, help us to be the kind of man, the kind of woman, the kind of minister, the preacher we are to be in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, you so anoint us, energize, empower us that when we rise up and we go to our various church locations or anywhere we are preaching, we will put the devil on the run in Jesus' name. We we'll pray, Lord, that your word will be fire from our mouth, will be hammer from our mouth, and Lord, we we'll pray it will do a great work in the hearts of all the people we are talking to in Jesus' name. Raise up your people, Lord, that everywhere we go, we will succeed. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Another Amen. Thank you very much. You can see that we're looking at the word of God. The centrality of the teaching ministry in a rapturable church. You'll find there we're qualified towards, we're qualified the word ministry. We say it's a teaching ministry. There are many people that carry on different kinds of ministries, but there is a teaching ministry. Then we have qualified the word church. We are spoken about the church as a rapturable church. Because the final goal, the reason we we'll do what, what we do is so that on the final day, the Lord Himself will approve of our work, and then the people who have led to the Lord, they will be rapturable in Jesus' name. As we look at the Acts of the Apostles, and you see how the people of God carried out the work of God, you'll see that the ministry they carried out was a teaching ministry. They taught the Word. And then they prepared the people of God so that they will make it when the Lord will come. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. I read from verse 1, And they based their ministry on how Jesus began and what Jesus did. And they knew they were to be an extension of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 1 verse 1. The former treatise, Have I made O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. He did, he also taught. He worked miracles, he gave messages. And then the Lord gave them instruction to wait in Jerusalem. Immediately after that instruction, we're told in verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men, angels, stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. After they understood what Jesus Christ had said, that he began doing, he began teaching, and they were to continue to carry on the ministry that he left behind. Then he went to heaven, and the angels appeared to them to say that this same Jesus will come again. Immediately then they knew they were to raise up people that will go with the Lord when he comes again. They would have remembered the ministry of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Reading from verse 15. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even with, from his mother's womb. You know, Jesus Christ told them that they should wait in Jerusalem until they were filled with the Holy Ghost, energized and empowered, emulated by the power of the Holy Ghost. And now he has gone to heaven. 
And what were they to do after receiving the Holy Ghost? Exactly what John was to do. Look at verse 16. And many of the children of Israel shall be turned to the Lord their God. They knew that what the Lord had given them to do was to carry on that ministry of turning the minds of the people unto the Lord. In verse 17, and he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just listen to this and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord and when the angels told them that this same Jesus will come again they knew immediately that they were to go forth to teach after receiving the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And they were to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. When Paul the Apostle came later into the kingdom and he to receive the commission to preach, he knew that what we to do is to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. We're looking at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man. The way we prepare people for the rapture, for the coming of the Lord, is by teaching. It says teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That Christ is coming. And the responsibility we have as ministers in the ministry is that we'll prepare the people of the Lord, we'll prepare them for the coming of the Lord to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. You come to Acts of the Apostles, you come to the last verse of the last chapter, Acts chapter 28. I'm reading there from verse 31. Remember that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And now we come to the final verse of the Acts of the Apostles. And he's talking about the ministry of Paul the Apostle to the very end of his life. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching. Teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. We learn then how central, how important, how essential, how indispensable the teaching ministry is as we minister in the church. We're going to look at three things. Number one, the priority of the teaching ministry. The priority of the teaching ministry. Number two, the purpose of its transforming ministry. The purpose of its transforming ministry. Number three, the passion for its triumphant ministry. The passion that we ought to have. The zeal we ought to have. The fire and the fervency within we ought to have for its triumphant ministry. Number one is the priority of the teaching ministry. As we come to the Acts of the Apostles, because these apostles were the people that carried out the message of Christ. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. You wonder what makes the church so solid, so steadfast, that the gates of hell will not be able to prevail? If there is anything that makes the church so solid, it will be the teaching of the Word of God, that we are so assured of what we believe, and that we are ready to give our very lives for what we believe, because we we'll have been well taught, taught in the Word. You show me an assembly, a congregation, where all that happens there is emotional thing, sentimental thing, and there's no solid teaching of the Word of God. And they are blown here and there by every wind of doctrine. And any crafty man, any crafty speaker can come to deceive them, and they will fall into the hands of anybody who knows how to talk what is so strong. 
that church will be destroyed by the devil. The gates of hell will come against that church or that assembly or that congregation and destroy it. But when a church is built by the teaching ministry and is solidly on the rock of ages, then the gates of hell will not be able to prevail. And that's what the apostles did from the very first day. Those 3,000 people came to know the Lord. Look at this in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. I mean in there from verse 42. It says, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Those apostles took time. And when they got those converts into the kingdom, they began to teach them the apostles' doctrines, that is, the doctrines of the Lord, because Jesus Christ has said that you go into all nations teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. It became so personal to them, it became the apostles' doctrines. That's, it's just like when uh, Paul was talking to those uh, people and said, God is going to judge every man according to my gospel. He personalized it. It became so much part of them as a very heart, as a very life, as their hands, as their legs, as every part of them were parts of them. That word of God, that doctrine became part of them as well. And you are going to find in Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. It runs through the Acts of the Apostles. That's why that church was strong. That's why the waves of persecution that came against that early church. That's why even they went from here to there and it was scattered everywhere. No wind of persecution could actually scatter them or blow them away like chaff in the wind. We're looking at Acts chapter 4 verse 1. And as they speak unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people. They taught the people. It's the teaching. And that's what the Lord is telling us, that we need to teach whatever we're preaching. We'll bring teaching into it. I will soon explain what teaching is all about and what teaching actually accomplishes. It says they were grieved. That is, all those Pharisees were grieved because we were teaching the people and they preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Look at verse 18. It says, and they called them and they commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach. They knew that the emphasis of what they did, it wasn't the drumming and the dancing. It wasn't the clapping and the shouting. It wasn't an emotional meeting or gathering. They knew that these apostles they specialized in teaching the people. And they didn't tell them don't dance. Of course they could dance if they wanted to. They didn't tell them I don't uh, have ceremonies and celebrations and have this and have that. And they didn't mind all that. They knew that all those ceremonies would not change life. All those festivities will not change life. They knew that all those things that people may do, social things will be a kind of people friendly and youth friendly and society friendly and culture friendly and tradition friendly. All those things will not change anybody. They knew the only thing that changed the minds of the people and turned them unto the Lord Jesus Christ and then they forsook the religion that was a saving souls. And the Pharisees couldn't bring them back, and they were so sure in the faith that they had. They knew it was a teaching. That's why they said, we're commanding you. You can do any other thing. You can gather together. You can fellowship together. You can, you know, have the Lord's Supper. You can have whatever else you want to have. You can celebrate. You can make noise. You can, you can even have night vigil. What we don't want to do, what you don't want you to do, is you don't speak or teach. In the name of Jesus. And then Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, more than unto God, judge ye, but we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. He continued, We are going to continue. I said, We are going to continue. And you know, after this, after this stretch, then they began to pray. Let's look at that prayer. Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, 
and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak or they may teach thy word. What concerns them wasn't just the persecution. What concerns them is that they will continue emphasizing and teaching and preaching that word of the Lord. We're appealing to everyone that is called a minister in this church that will prepare very well. We go to the congregation and then we we'll bring the word, the word of life, and we teach. And when we teach, people's lives are turned around. In verse 33, it says, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. I pray that will happen to us. Let's look at chapter 5, verse 28. The centrality of the teaching ministry, the priority of the teaching ministry in the church. Let's look at chapter 5, verse 28. It says, saying, Did we not strictly, seriously, and firmly command you that you should not teach in this name? Their concern was the teaching. They said, We called you. We told you. We gave you all the liberty you wanted to do, any other thing you wanted to do, but we gave you something very strict and very firm. You should not teach in this name. But now behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. And not just preaching some superficial messages flowing in the air, some motivational things that will tickle them, doctrine. Something very clear that they laid line upon line and precept upon precept that concerned the lives of those people that told them that Jesus is the only way. And they told them that by repenting of their sins, coming to the Lord, they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There will be a change, a transformation in their lives. And they were not there when they were teaching them, but everybody knew the doctrine. How did they know? Because the people that went out of those congregations, they filled Jerusalem, and they went here and there, and they could see the impact of the doctrine in their lives. They could see the evidence of what they had been learning. And these religious leaders said, what we told you, not to teach in this name. Now you have filled Jerusalem. What does that mean, to fill Jerusalem? It was, it's a large city. Jerusalem, it has been large. You know, Jerusalem has been there from the time immemorial, as I say, a long, long time. And they had expanded here and there. You know, the building of Jerusalem, that big city, great city. And now, in every corner, there was somebody from any part of Jerusalem that was part of the fellowship. We are not talking about any other thing, doctrine. Doctrine, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Savior. I repented of my sin. I came to know the Lord. I cannot follow all those rituals anymore because Jesus Christ has turned my life around. He did something in them and eventually I go to the ears of those members of the Sanhedrin. They said, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. They threatened them again, but look at verse 29, it says then Peter, and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to be God rather than men. Now listen to this, the God of our, fa of our fathers, raised up Jesus, whom the only slew, and hanged on a tree. You know what they just uh, told them not to do? Don't teach in that name, and immediately they mentioned that name. You intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Immediately he said, Whom ye slew and hanged on a tree, him as God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. That's exactly what they were just saying. Don't do that. And he kept on doing it. Even before then, they were committed to that teaching ministry. You know what they did? They flogged them. They beat them. They persecuted them. Look at this, verse 41, that same chapter. And they departed from the presence of the council, 
rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Verse 42 and what's the next word there? Daily. Daily. You know there are people that uh, and sometimes they accuse us. They say uh, they're so heavenly minded. They don't have any other thing to do. And accuse us that our Mondays are given to studying the Bible. And they say that, you know, some of us who are workers and leaders, and uh, some, you know, these uh, leaders that God has raised up in that church, they go there on Tuesday for the called leaders meeting. And then they say that, you know, uh, the, those of them that also belong to the choir, maybe they have choir practice on Wednesday. And then they say on Thursday they have their miracle revival service. They say on Friday there's something they're doing. Maybe one committee is meeting, another committee is meeting on Saturday. All their workers are together. And Bible, Bible, every time. And they get to them on Sunday. They start with study the scripture. And then they have delayed it on them again. They said, what? Well, every day. Well, it's not even everybody that comes every day. But look at this one here, chapter 5, in verse 42. And daily in the temple and daily in every house. Our house fellowship is just one day in the week. On the Sunday evening, these people, they do it every day, every day, every day. Just teaching the word of God. They knew the centrality and they knew the priority of the word of God. If we are dead, simplified deed for our church and we just have Sunday service, we do not have any excuse not to be there. We have a Monday Bible study. No, no excuse not to be there. And then we have a Thursday revival hour. No excuse for you not to be there. They did it every day. Because they knew the importance. And they knew the essence. They knew the priority. They knew the centrality of this teaching ministry. And he said, and this is not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. I pray that as the Lord is bringing us back to this, we're going to get back fully in Jesus' name. I said we'll get back fully in Jesus' name. Brothers and sisters, uh, uh, we thank God the past is gone. Something new is beginning in Jesus' name. We thank the Lord that, uh, you know, all, the old year is gone. And all the mistakes we made in the old year, I believe God has forgiven us in Jesus' name. Any kind of a carefree, careless attitude, whatever, that we had in the past, I believe that all that is gone. And we shouldn't, uh, you know, be sorrowful and feeling guilty, you know, I didn't attend Bible, I didn't attend Bible study regularly that time. Well, that time is gone and God has uh, overlooked that, but this is a new year, we are going to change. I said we're going to change. Uh, you, you know, you know. Sometimes uh, it may be about uh, you know immediately by after the Bible study. I'll be so interested to you know whether you know how did uh, that Bible study go in your area. I want to know about the about this and about that. And then I just uh, call on the phone. I I call one of the leaders and say, my brother, how are you? I'm I'm, I'm doing all right. As the family family is doing all right. I said, we just finished the Bible study, and I saw that, uh, you know, over here in Lagos, there were had some clouds, and they have told me that whenever clouds are there like that, the transmission might be distorted a little bit. How was it on your side? And then my brother will keep quiet and say, brother, well, you have the Bible study, and then he'll say, sir, today, you know, I don't know what happened. I said, tell me the story. I wasn't able to attend today. I said, how could you do that? That's the backbone of the church. And you're a leader. And when your members see that you are not there just one Monday in the week, and people have referred to this Bible as a Bible school, because God takes us deep into the world. How could you be like that? You should be there. You should be there. And leave an example. If you are not there, I wish sure that your wife will be there, your children will be there, and you deny your children the privilege, opportunity of attending the Bible study every time. Don't feel guilty, the past is gone, God has forgiven us, but I'm saying that this is a new year, something new is going to happen in Jesus' name. And we are going to be there, we do it every day, we can do it every week because of the importance of the teaching of the Word of God. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, we're looking at verse 25 and verse 26. It says, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus, for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. 
centrality of the teaching ministry. It taught much people. That was the important thing then, and that is still the important thing today. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 20. Chapter 20, verse 20. Acts 20, 20. It says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you, and I've taught you publicly and from house to house. I have taught you publicly that the reason we gather together as a congregation, as Christian people, church people, and then we have the central teaching. Then Paul the Apostle said, I also visited my members. I did visit them to go and eat. I did visit them to go and do just how are you doing there? That's not bad, but Paul said, I did more than that. And I went from house to house, and I did household Bible study for them. And I taught you from house to house, and I said, I kept nothing back. There's the subjects of the Bible that will demand some real serious digging deep into the Word for us to understand and for us to be able to obey. And Paul the Apostle said, I didn't keep that back either. There are some things that the other preachers will not agree with, like the, um, like the importance of circumcision. The fact that circumcision is done away with and the law of Moses is no more important. And the temple, and the law, and all the ceremonies, they're no more important. Paul, the apostle, had a difficult time with the other apostles before they could understand. And yet, he said, all those things that are profitable unto you, whether the others agreed or not, I kept nothing back from you in the teaching of the word of God. Look at this in verse 25, and now behold, I know that he all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shown to declare unto you all the counsel of God. All the counsel of God. And that's the reason we encourage you to come to the Bible study if you're going to know all the counsel of God. You see, Sunday preaching is topical preaching. Topical means which is a topic. Maybe we're having a Sunday scripture uh, lesson that day, and then out of whatever is there, we choose a topic. That's topical preaching. But the Monday Bible study is where we go from book to book, and from verse to verse, and from chapter to chapter. And in that way, we cover a lot of grounds. And then we're not keeping from anyone anything that is profitable. And we can easily say, because of that series of just going from book to book, and chapter to chapter, and verse to verse, that we are teaching the whole counsel of God. You know, sometimes if you are a minister, you are choosing a topic for Sunday, and maybe you are doing evangelism, you are having all those newcomers, and then you choose the topic, you say, newcomers will not understand this, the newcomers will not understand this, but you know, for Monday Bible say we cannot do that, because we just go from patch to patch to patch, and whoever is there, whether it's a new convert or it's an old timer, we just cover everything, and it is through that. We are able to cover all the counsel of God. And when you are there, you go through a real Bible school, I pray you will be there. I said I pray you will be there. And then you will invite other people, make publicity about it. And make sure that uh, you, know, you encourage all our people. And then the time shall be right. So that this word of God, we are not going to miss it. It tells us, look at number 27 again, uh, the challenge the apostle is giving you and giving to me. That why I have not shunned, I have not been careless, I have not neglected my duty to declare to you all the counsel of God. And when he says we are declaring all the counsel of God and we are teaching, what does, uh, what does teaching really do? What we say, the priority of teaching. And we are looking at the purpose of that teaching. If I write that word teach, T is to transform. You see, if we just come and we just uh, describe some things in the Bible, you can spend a whole hour talking about the ark of 
Noah. He can spend a whole hour talking about the building of the tabernacle in the Old Testament. You can talk, you can spend a whole week talking about the temple of Solomon. And you can spend a whole lifetime talking about all those principles of the in the Proverbs. But if he doesn't change lives, that's not teaching. If he doesn't transform lives, that's not teaching. If he doesn't train them to become accomplished men of God and women of God, that's not teaching. If it is going to be teaching, the team there is that it transforms people. And then it trains people and prepares them for life. That's where the Lord transforms our marriages, transforms our way of walking, transforms our attitudes, transforms our relationships, transforms our character, it transforms everything about us. It is the teaching that transforms our lives like that. If there is to educate, is to educate. If there is to enlighten. The E of the teaching is to edify. You see, when we come to teach, it's not just that I'm reading some verses of the Bible. It's not just that I cover from, from Genesis to Revelation. I must make sure that as these words are coming forth, that it is edifying people. It's building people up. It's enlightening them. I didn't see that before. Now I can see. I didn't know that before. Now I know. Let's look at Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24, as Jesus spoke to the people and he taught them, look at verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded, exposition, teaching, explaining, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Look at the result, verse 32. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn when within us while he touched with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures, he opened the scriptures unto us while light changed. Who are edified, who are educated. The things we didn't know before by the teaching of Christ, we knew. Look at verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Lord Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. Well, when we teach then, we are transforming lives. We are transforming families. We are e edifying them, enlightening them, educating them. A, e, there is to arm them. We put the armor on them. And to arm them is to strengthen them for the battle ahead of them. When somebody comes to listen to us and we teach, they become strong in their hearts and they become firm in their conviction. And actually, we anchor them, anchor them to the truth. The teaching of the Word of God, the Adam, is to say, this is a solid rock. And then we anchor your life on that solid rock. It anchors us to the truth. It affirms us in the truth. You see, when somebody comes to the Bible study, or it comes to a Sunday meeting, or it comes to any meeting that you are having, and you are teaching the Word of God, they are armed. They say, now I have that promise. Now I have that precept. Now I have that understanding. Now I pick up that principle. Now I know how to put the devil on the run. Now I know how to be able to answer all the people that try to confuse me. Because they are armed, they are anchored, they are firmed in the truth. You see, as we come to the word of God, the chief there is to transform and she there is to train. The E there is to educate, to enlighten, and to edify. And the aid is to arm you, and it is to affirm you the truth, and to anchor you. The C is to courage. It's to courage. 
That doesn't mean that we are not Christians. Of course, we are. Many of us are. When I say many of us, I don't mean we are all Christians. I'm talking about our congregation. The, the people that come, the congregation, many of them are already born again. Many of them are sanctified. And many of them, they are filled with the Holy Ghost. But you know, the heart is right. But the head is not knowing everything they ought to know. How many people are saved and they have, they have good hearts? They have sanctified hearts. But because they lack knowledge in their head, they are having problems in their marriage. They have good hearts, they are born again, they are children of God, but something needs to be corrected in their attitude, in their marriages. Sometimes it's in the places of work, and they say, I don't know why I'm not succeeding. They are good in their hearts, they love God in their hearts, but in their heads they do not know the principle or the work ethics that will make them succeed. And because of that lack of knowledge, in their head, in their mind, and they come to listen to us and we're teaching them. Then we're able to correct them. Not only that, the teaching will connect them. It will connect them to the source, to the resource that we have, to heaven and to the Almighty God. It's when we come and we're teaching me faith. And you're talking about how to believe. You anchor me on the truth of the word of God, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free or set you free. And then you connect me with the Almighty. You remind me, He's my Father. I can pray to Him. He's my Father. He will answer me. You connect me to the Lord Jesus Christ. You tell me that He has given me everything I will ever need for life of Godliness. You connect me with the Holy Ghost that He abides with me. He abides in me and is praying for me. The teaching we are talking about will correct us, will connect us, will convince us. You see, when somebody comes to our teaching, to our preaching, and we're teaching the Word of God, there must be that thing that I'm convinced now. And then when they go out there, and somebody is bringing something different, something false, they say, no, you have come too late. I'm convinced already that this is the way. Not only that the teaching convinces us, it convicts us. You see, when we're hearing the Word of God, if it's a real teaching, the teaching of the Word of God, it is going to convict us and say, well, looks like I feel guilty about that. Not feeling guilty about that. That's, that's nothing. That doesn't mean that you are a sinner. It doesn't mean that you are not born again. It's just like, you know, maybe let's say a wife cooks uh, for the husband and she's put everything she knows into that food, but in serving the food, it just suppose uh, that maybe it's a cup of water that, uh, a glass of water that, uh, you know, she forgot. And then the husband, uh, while eating, you know, the pepper, the oil, whatever is going the wrong direction. I don't know where it goes. I'm not a biologist. And then the fellow, it begins to call. Oh, pardon my, my honey. Water. What, where is water? And tears are already coming out of the face. Now could you be, do this? I'm sorry about that. Does that mean that she's not born again? Tell me out loud. Because I hear that some people love their wives in the toilet. <laughs> no. I hope you are not like that. And then you drink the water and then you say, thank you, honey. That was just a mistake. You know, we can make mistakes and that doesn't spoil the marriage. I pray that you, you know, as I'm teaching, I'm not even teaching a marriage. I'm already going into marriage already. And then already I'm compelling you to love your wife. You see, because the teaching will compel us to compel us. You see, that's what teaching does. The teaching will train us. And the teaching will transform us. The teaching, it will eventually educate and enlighten and edify. The teaching will alter our attitude, will change our attitude, will modify the things we have been doing that are not all right. Affirm us, anchor us, arm us, or correct us and connect us and convince us and convict us and compel us. And the teaching will help us. I'll be able to say, I went for that meeting. And, you know, I was having this question in mind concerning this area of my life, this area of my family, this area of relationship with people, and this area in my ministry. And 
something that was said in that teaching has helped me. You see, the teaching must help us and the teaching must heal us. You see, when we hear the word of God, it suits us, it comforts us, and then we're healed in our heart, in our mind. It's not just bodily healing alone. There's bodily healing, there's a healing of the soul, there's a healing of the mind, there's a healing of our intelligence, there's a healing of our families, there's a healing of the land, there's a healing of the ministry, and the teaching will bring help, and the teaching will bring healing, the teaching will bring harvest, harvest. You see, when we're teaching the word of God, you know, some people will say, I got saved during the time of the teaching of the Monday Bible study. Other people will say, I got saved during the retreat. Other people will say, I got saved in a particular conference because the teaching will bring in a harvest. It will help us, it will heal us, it will have a source into the kingdom. That's why, that's the reason why the teaching is a priority. And we'll make it a priority in this new year in our churches in Jesus' name. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we're looking at verses 1 and 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now, therefore, my son. Can I tell you something? That Paul referred to Timothy as my son. And then you are wondering, I wish I were there. That Paul would refer to me as a son. Well, you are not there, but you have seen everything he told Timothy. He wrote that down. And if you want to be a son, yes, a child of God, I know, a daughter of God, I know, but you want to be a son spiritually to Paul the Apostle. Read all these Pauline epistles and read them carefully, just like a son, and say, This, I know it's the word of God, but I want to have this special relationship that Timothy had with Paul. And then you go to these epistles, you study them, you read them, you swallow them. You meditate on them until when you are speaking, when you are teaching other people, all those words will be coming out of your heart. Then it says, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to do what? To teach others also. You see, brothers and sisters, there are people that they do not understand what makes a church sound, stable, steadfast, and solid. It's, you know, we have different kinds of ministers. There are some ministers, they do not have the patience to go from verse to verse, lay line upon line, and precept upon precept. All they can do, they pick a verse of scripture. Out of that verse of scripture, they fly off. And a lot of ideas and thoughts just come into their brains. And they just dish out whatever is coming. And whatever they are saying for the next one hour has no connection with the verse they have read. But it's motivating, it's encouraging, it looks lively, and it moves here and there, and people are happy, and people are excited, and they say, shout, and give me a good amen, and say, hallelujah, I'm telling you that the devil can never get you. And then all that kind of doors, they raise up, and the people, they hallow, they shout, they jump, they do that, they speak in tongues, and do a lot of it. Even in some of our churches, people lie. And the people are happy, but they don't understand that Paul the Apostle said, By the leading of the Spirit, said Timothy, You are going to pass on everything I've given you. Don't give it to those people that just raise dust, the people that just shout and holler. You will give them to the people that have the ability to teach others also. Because of the importance of teaching, so that we are able to choose the right kind of leaders. And sometimes, as you know, young people, if you go to some young people, and then you have somebody who can do all that, and run, and jump, and get them excited, and then they go back home and they say, church was church today, you know. We go to the church, I never saw service like that in my life. I'm telling you, that thing was very lively. There's no dull moment at all. And then you come, and then they all come. And then the church is increasing in number. And people begin to say, look at the number here, look at the number. It's not the number. How many of those people know where they are going? 
How many of them know? If all these, uh, permit me to mention this, Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons will come to them and they show them this, this and that, how many of them will be able to stand? That's the reason why we have drifting. You know, this one will drift there and that one will drift there. But when you are solid on the word of God and the teachers and the leaders who are appointing in the church, the people who can teach others also, they understand that this teaching ministry is a real thing. Now you are going to find that in the qualifications of uh, the ministers, there is uh, something they are apt to teach, apt to teach. It's not, you know, I'm able to mobilize people, motivate people, I'm able to raise them up and do this and that. Art to teach. That art is aptitude. Having aptitude in teaching. Come to this second Timothy, in chapter 2, verse 2. And it says that thou hast heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men, faithful men, faithful men, who shall be able to teach Others also, point number two now, the purpose of its transforming ministry. The purpose of its transforming ministry. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 24. In Acts 18 verse 24, we read about this man. It says, and a certain Jew named Apollos, Born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, a mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. An eloquent man. Not only that, he was mighty in the scriptures. He knew the scriptures. And he knew how to pass those scriptures to other people convincingly. We're told in verse 25, this man was instructed in the way of the Lord and be fervent in spirit. That means that when I was teaching the word of God, it was penetrating the hearts of the people. It was fervent. It wasn't dull. It wasn't sleeping on the message. But the word penetrated their hearts and then they speak and touch diligently. To teach diligently means that you are very systematic about it. You go from one point to the other, and there is a link, there is a connection. They are, they are like rings of a, of a chain, that those rings are connected together, and there is a flowing from one point to the other. There is a logical sequence from one thing to the other. It says, immediately he taught them, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. He himself was an accomplished teacher of the word of God to the level he knew. That is, to the level of the doctrines taught by John the Baptist. And John the Baptist taught quite a lot, quite a lot. And yet, he didn't go beyond that. When Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife, when they saw this man, they took him home, and then they taught him more perfectly the way of the Lord. See the result in verse 27. And when he was disposed to pass into a care, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. That is, some other people had become Christians before he even got there. But when he got there, he helped them much. What does that mean? He taught them because teaching will transform, teaching will educate, teaching will alter wrong perspectives and affirm you in the truth and anchor you in the truth. And teaching will correct and connect and convince and convict and compel. And teaching will also help. He helped them much. Those who have believed. Then he says, For he mightily convinced the Jews. You see that? Mightily. Mightily. Did he convince the Jews? And that, and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. That's the purpose. So that people are helped. People are edified. 
people become stable, steadfast, stabilized in their faith. And there's no shadow of doubting, of doubt in their hearts anymore as to what the Lord is telling them. Ephesians chapter 4, the purpose of his transforming ministry. We'll talk of the centrality of the teaching ministry in a rapturable church. The purpose of that, that we have the teaching of the Word of God. And I think uh, our members ought to know this, brothers and sisters. We thank God for the unity we have in our church. We thank God for the understanding we have in our church. And we thank God for the way we submit in our churches. And I pray that that kind of unity and fellowship and submission the Lord has given us, it will continue in our church in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen. amen. Uh, you know, as we look at the Word of God, the Bible says, I'm going to read it to you now, but let me just explain. It says that He gave some apostles, He gave some prophets, He gave some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. The goal is the perfecting of the saints for the edifying of the body of Christ and for the work of the ministry. But you see, it's not everybody that has apostolic ministry. It's not everybody that has a prophetic ministry. If you call any of us, some of our leaders, if you call them impromptu, and you call them to come and, you know, teach us impromptu without any preparation, they'll talk to us about the rapture, about the great tribulation, about the Antichrist, about the second coming, about the millennial reign, about the battle of Armageddon, and about the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ on the final day as they rise into the city on the white horse and tell them to talk about the mighty supper of the Lamb and to talk about heaven in Jerusalem and to talk about hell. They are going to be able to place everything the way it ought to be. And then they to have all the verses relevant to that. But there are some teachers that could do that. Some people, they lead towards the ministry of the evangelist. Other people lead towards the ministry of the pastor. They love people, they gather people together, they shepherd people, and they visit people, and they care for people quite enough, but they do not have the teaching part of the ministry. And now, a person might be in a particular church because the pastor is a, is a kind of genial person, a good person, a lovable person, hospitable person, visits them in the hospital and he cares for them and he prays along with them and if there's any problem, he's a real pastor, a real shepherd, but he's not a teacher. And then, eventually, you might say, the church is growing because love attracts people. Love is like a magnet. But there is the teaching part of this will be missing. And if we see that, and I say, this is wonderful. He's a great man of God in his right. But if we see that that congregation needs the teaching aspect of the ministry, we might say, Pastor, you will go to this other side. Now, that other side, they have majored on teaching, but a little bit uh, kind of uh, dry. The oil of love. And the oil of mercy and grace is not, is not present over there. And that is what you have. You have done enough here. You go to that other side and show them this kind of pastoral ministry. And let love and let some oil come. All the friction there. Everything will go away. And then we'll remove them and say, you go there. And then we'll bring a teacher over here. Because over here, well, all the love and all the mercy and all the grace and everything, and then we will bring, not that that teacher doesn't have a pastoral ministry to you, he has, but it's not to the level of the other person. Then, because normally it's painful, relationships are very strong. And relationships, you know, once you are related with somebody like that, especially somebody very loving and, you know, who can help us and all that, if we remove that person to go and help where, the, where we need him, and then we bring another person where you actually need a teaching ministry. If it were not for our unity and fellowship and submission to leadership, there would be a problem. Why did they take him away? We love him. Of course, we know you love him. He loves us. Of course, we know he loves you. But God needs him in a better, in a greater service in another place. There must not be any selfishness in the congregation. 
And we shouldn't just accept, okay, we release him grudgingly, cheerfully in our hands. Because it's the same church. Don't you want the other people there to be blessed as well? The other people there also to feel the love and see the kind of revival it's able to bring here. That's why we do what we do. But we don't have to come to your local church to explain that to you. If I were to come to every local church, every time we transfer a leader, every time we put this person and put that person there, if I have to go personally to every local church to explain that, the reason why we're doing that, I'll not have any other thing to do. I appreciate, you know, your understanding and your patience with me that, you know, well, maybe once in a while, the gray old man, you know, maybe is, uh, is uh, making mistakes. Well, maybe after a few days, you understand, there's no mistake at all. God is leading us in our church. And as God is leading us, we're going to cooperate together in Jesus' name. You know, see how that amen is amen. Praise the Lord. You know, I, I always love, you know, that kind of amen that, uh, you know, makes the revival to come up. You even they want to give me another amen. Yeah. Thank you. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm looking at verse 11. He gives some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. That's the, that's the purpose. For the perfecting, the maturing of the saints. So that by the grace of God, the teaching ministry maturing us, developing us, enlightening us, edifying us. Then it says, for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. This is what it says. So we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You know, sometimes, uh, because we do not have, we do not all have this five-fold ministry of the apostle, of the prophet, of the evangelist, of the teacher, and of the pastor. And it takes all these fivefold ministries to perfect the saints and to edify the body of Christ and to raise up strong, militant, aggressive soul winners. Because of that, that's why we move ourselves around. And we say, you've done enough pastoral ministry there, you go for pastoral ministry, we need teaching ministry there. You've done enough prophetic work there, we need evangelistic work there now, you are evangelist, you go over here. Because we just call ourselves overseers, just this region overseer, and state overseer, national overseer, that's just a general term. But if you look at one at us one by one, you'll see that there, there may be a few of us that can fit into a position of apostle and prophet and evangelist and pastor and teacher, just a few of us. But a lot of us will fit into this category, will fit into this category, will fit into this category. And we need all that for these people here so that they'll be perfected. I pray that God will give you understanding. And they will be able to walk with understanding in Jesus' name. Look at verse 14, the purpose. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sledge of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait. We're looking at uh, Nehemiah chapter 8. We're pointing out here the purpose and also the principles of the transforming ministry of a teaching ministry. We're looking at our, yeah, this Nehemiah now, chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. We're reading from verse 8. Nehemiah 8, verse 8. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. That's teaching. It says, they read, you know, anybody can read, but sometimes when people read, they don't observe the punctuation marks. When people read, sometimes they do not observe the verb and the nouns. They pronounce the, you know, the words the same way. It's maybe read or read, but the same spelling. 
and they might not pay attention to whether it is red or read. And because they just read it, it's not distinct. It's not clear. Sometimes it's a box, sometimes it's a box, a verb or a noun. But it's not clear the way they are reading it to us. And if you are not looking at your Bible to see what is being read, you might be confused. But when we read it, it says they read distinctly. And then they gave the sense that is, this is what this means. This is the connection. This is the context. This is what came before. This is what comes after. And this that is wedged is in between this and that. It must not contradict what came before. It must not contradict what comes after. It is when we know the context and the original hearers of this thing we're reading. What did they understand? And what was the application to them in our situation today? What is the application to us? That's what says so from Paul's doctrine. But if we don't understand that, and somebody just read opens the Bible, and then he just looks at a particular verse, and he doesn't know the connection with that verse at all, and he just goes ahead and begins to preach and begins to talk, whatever it is, we can get into false doctrine. Or my temporarily encourage people, but when those people get back home and they read what you have read unto them, and they read some few verses before and few verses after, they say, uh -uh, "Look at what this uh, pastor said. It's not connected with this. It's like he has deceived us, and eventually we might lose credibility." That's why in teaching the word of God, we must be men that study, so that we are well equipped. I will not be ashamed because we are rightly dividing the word of God. Look at that verse again, chapter 8, verse 8 of Nehemiah. So, the wretch in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the saints and it caused them to understand what they had read. We are looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, reading from verse 9. It says, and moreover, because the preacher was wise. Because the preacher was wise. What wisdom is he talking about? Is he talking about the wisdom of hiding the truth from people? Is he talking about the wisdom of covering up the real pungent, painful uh, truths in the world? Is that not that kind of wisdom? That's the wisdom of the world. It's like, you know, if a medical doctor knows that somebody has a killer disease, and then he knows that this person is about to die, but will not tell that person the truth, that even if the person will die, should make his way right with God, and get ready for heaven. And he's saying, uh, 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 Mr. So-and-so, it will be all right. And he knows in his heart, it's not all right. Doctor, why are you doing that? Because I don't want him to, you know, be afraid or to panic or to feel that, you know, the thing is so serious. Even though I know it's serious, but the man may die. Yes, I know he may die, but he's not ready for heaven. I didn't think about that. You must think about that. The wisdom is to be able to present that painful truth. Present it to him with wisdom. Well, you know, God heals and... Uh, I know you are not too old. There are people who are much, much older than you. Even in your family, there are people who are much older than you are. But uh, let, let's just suppose for a moment, because you can be healed, you can become well, get back to work and everything. is right. But should in case this thing results in the negative side, we should think about both sides. What if you were to die? I'm not saying you are going to die. What if you were to die? What will happen? We know there's heaven, we know there's hell. Are you ready to meet the Lord your God? Why don't we pray and search all that? And if you get healed, there's no harm. Getting saved is wonderful, even when you're healed. And, and if you die, wonderful. Because then, all this pain and everything, you overcome that, and then you go straight to heaven. And if the person is a believer, and you know that he has a terminal sickness and he might die. You are a medical doctor, you know he might die. And you know the scriptures. You present the word of God with wisdom. You are not saying, oh, sister, it's all right. Sister, it's all right. And sister is saying, doctor, 
I, I feel worse today than I was yesterday. And it appears the thing is speeding up. And you know from your examination, this fellow may die. But then you say, I want to be wise. That's not wisdom. And then the person, he says, well, I'm even feeling that I want to get this. A doctor says, don't talk about that now because, you know, you, don't, you can't have any body now to bear. I can't be thinking of, you know, conflict and this and that now. It just, it just, I just want to give up peace of mind. Ah, ah, that's deception now. But if we say, God can heal you, he even raises the dead, even if they die, God can raise you up from the dead. But should in case he does not, because when Stephen died, God did not raise him up. That was chapter 8. And in chapter 9, and Peter went to come to Dorcas, and Dorcas was raised from the dead. And the same Peter, very close to James, James was not raised from the dead. Should in case you die, are you ready to meet the Lord? The wisdom is not to hide the truth from people. The wisdom is to tell them in such a way they will say, it might come to this, it might come to that, but I'm going to get ready to meet the Lord. After all, one day, one day, all of us will go. So going is not a problem. That's why it says over here, look at verse 9 again, moreover, because the preacher was wise. He still taught the people knowledge. Don't teach error, teach knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many, that's what there is principle, many principles, many proverbs. That is, he sought clearly, he sought very carefully, and he set everything in order. That's preaching, that's teaching. We we'll set everything in order, and then we're able to teach the people of God. Look at verse 10. It says, the preacher sought to find out acceptable words. After you have gathered all your material together, we we'll seek acceptable words. That is, words that when we say them, the people will understand, and then we we'll string them together, we we'll join them together, we we'll link them together in such a way that they will remember because it is not what I hear today that is going to help me tomorrow. It is what I remember of what I hear tomorrow that is going to help me tomorrow. Not just hearing, not just we had a good service, a wonderful service, and then we jumped, we, cried, we shouted, we prayed, and every, everything was wonderful. But tomorrow, now you, you're doing this, I'm not having trials or temptation or persecution or pressure or challenges or conflict. It is tomorrow when I get to my place of work. And when I get back to the situation I came from, that the challenges may rise up again. And then when I remember what I heard yesterday, what I heard on the first day of this year, that it is the first day of a glorious year. And I know that I have a prophetic day. I have a preparatory day. And I have a, a, a day that is a peculiar day. And I remember that when I get to the middle of the year and I remember what I heard because the words were so framed in such a way I can remember. It is that that helps me. And it is that that will help you. That's why it says over here in verse 10 that the preacher sought out acceptable words and that way which was reaching, was upright, even the words of truth, the words of, you, of the wise are as goals, and they are nails passed in by the masters of the assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. The Lord is telling us that we need to be wiser as preachers of the word of God. We're going to do it in Jesus' name. In First Timothy chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. First Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading verses 15 and 16. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly unto them, that thy prophecy may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself, and unto the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself, and them that hear thee. Point number three, the passion for its triumphant ministry. The passion for its triumphant ministry. I pray the Lord will give us passion. He will give us fervency. And when we speak the word, we will speak that word, it will penetrate into the hearts of the people in Jesus' name. And you know Jesus Christ, when he taught, that's the way he taught, he taught with passion. He taught with conviction. That's why we're told in Matthew chapter 7. 
Matthew chapter 7 and from verse 28 and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things the people were astonished at his doctrine for he taught the people as one having authority and not as a scribe authority the authority did not come by shouting you know some people uh, when they want to emphasize something and they want to say that they are passionate about what they are saying they shout a lot and they, that may make some timid people afraid or shout at them but it's the authority that convinces the person that this is the word of the lord and that authority i pray the lord will grant to us in jesus name you remember in john chapter 7 when the people went to uh, catch jesus christ that is to arrest him and then the people eventually said, those officers came back and they said, well, the person will told you to go and take. John chapter 7 verse 45. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Never man speak like this man. Never man speak like this man. And then they answered the, uh, them. They then answered them, the Pharisees, are ye also deceived? Everybody that goes to that man is deceived. They come back and they cannot uh, continue what they were standing on before. They are swayed. They brought you another kind of understanding. And we told you to go and arrest him. Have you also been deceived? But you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, He affected the minds of the people because of a passion in the transforming message, triumphant message that He preached. Luke chapter 23. In Luke chapter 23, look at the accusation that He gave Him because of the effect and the impact of His preaching, of His teaching. Luke chapter 23, verse 5. And they were the more fierce, saying, His tyrants of the people, teaching. He stirs up the people, teaching that when the people did listen to him, they couldn't remain calm. They couldn't remain on the same old road. He stirs them up. He stirs them up to a verdict and to a decision. Teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. And so we must have that same kind of passion that we are able to teach and the people when we teach, they will have to decide that this is the truth and they are going to walk in it. And then the Holy Ghost will take over and in every word that they have heard from you, when they get into a crossroad, the Lord will use those words and make their lives better in Jesus' name. We are looking at um, Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30, I'm reading from verse 20. Though the Lord give you the bread of, of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall he not take thy teachers, shall, shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. Praise the Lord. You know, the Lord is saying over here that even when there's a famine, even when there's drought, even when there's scarcity, that uh, well, the adversity that's serious enough, the drought and the family that's serious enough, but he says, I'm going to do you a favor because I'm going to give you your teachers. I will not remove your teachers away into a corner. Why that? Because the teaching of the Word of God can reverse all those situations, can bring faith in our heart, and can bring surplus again, can bring prosperity again. And whatever adverse situation we're facing, if God gives us teachers of the Word, that teachers are not removed into a corner. It says, For thy bone and eyes shall see thy teachers, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Those are the teachers who have taught us in such a way that you train us to transform our lives. They educate us to enlighten us. And these are people that connect us with this resource of heaven. And these are the people that they arm us and they anchor us onto the truth. And now they have helped us and our ears are hearing the word behind us saying, This is the way. What he in it. When you turn to the right and when you turn to the left. 
I pray that our teachers, uh, those of us who are here, those of us who are not here, you are hearing by recorded message, that all of us will become more effective in the gospel of the Lord in the teaching ministry in Jesus' name. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3, I'm looking at verse 15 here, and I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and with understanding. I pray that you will be such a pastor. You'll be such an overseer. You'll be such a teacher. And when you teach, your, life, your teaching, your ministry, as well as your life, will help people to come closer to the Lord and connect them with heaven, with the Almighty. And when Jesus will come, all our converts, all our disciples, all our members, all the people in our church will be rapturable in Jesus' name. I pray God will use you and I pray your reward, you will not miss it in Jesus' name. Let's rest up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Just tell the Lord, oh Lord, I've heard your word. I've seen the centrality of the teaching ministry. I've seen the importance of the teaching ministry. I've seen the essence, how essential it is, the teaching ministry. And all this that I've seen, oh Lord, help me so that I will be capable and effective a person that is apt to teach, having the ability to teach. I know we might be tired, but you know, still uh, discipline yourself and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, help me. The Lord will help you, will help us. Talk to the Lord. The centrality of the teaching ministry. And when our people are well taught, You will not be like children tossed to and fro, blown about by every wind of doctrine. It will be a church that is built upon the rock, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. In our meetings, Let's reduce emotion. So people will listen to the word with the understanding, with intelligence. And we'll prepare very well. We don't just come to our congregation, stir them up, no preparation. Grab a Bible, take one verse, and run off. The church is not going to be strong that way. Let the Lord build you up so that you can be a great instrument in His hand in building the church according to His purpose.